All righty. Well, um, today I've called the message, Shut Up and Take My Pigs, and uh, I'm going to come to that right at the end. Bit of a cryptic title for a sermon. Uh, we're going to get there in just a second. Now, um, as we've been seeing, Christian faith, it's very simple. Uh, deep, yes, big, yes, but profoundly simple. And the simplicity of Christianity often gets missed because we've had 2,000 years of people painting over the simplicity of the message of Jesus. And last week we saw that uh, in 2015 in the Palace of Monaco, the Prince's Palace in Monaco, uh, some art restorers discovered in the ceiling a whole series of frescoes that for hundreds and hundreds of years had just been painted over. And people had forgotten the artistry, the beauty of what was originally there. In 2015, a team of 40 art restorers came in and started scraping back the paint to kind of uncover what was originally there, the beauty of what was originally there that had been covered over by layers and layers of paint. And what we're doing as a church at the start of this year and what we do at the start of every year Every year, we open one of the Gospels about Jesus to peel back the paint, uh, so it is, that's been covered and obscured genuine Christianity. And as a result, we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew to start off this year. The Gospel of Matthew is written by an eyewitness who saw these things. He heard Jesus teach. He watched him do his ministry. And he's written it down so that we might have confidence that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we're in the middle of Matthew's Gospel now, Matthew's chapter 8 to 9, which, uh, which contain a series of nine different stories where Jesus interacts with people in desperate need and he comes and brings his kingdom into their lives. Uh, we saw two weeks ago a series of three miracles that he did. Last week we looked at the calming of the storm and this week we're seeing the healing of these two demon-possessed men. And in each one of these stories, Matthew, the gospel writer, he confronts us with the question, who is Jesus and what are you going to do with him? Who is he and what is the right way to respond? What is the right way to respond to Jesus? And the answer, of course, is to put your faith in Jesus. And in each one of these episodes, we'll either see great faith, little faith, or no faith at all. Two weeks ago, we saw the faith of the centurion who says to Jesus, you don't even need to come to my house, just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, wow, I haven't seen greater faith in all of Israel. And then last week, the disciples come to Jesus in the boat and they're terrified and Jesus says, little faith. And this week, we're going to see the healing of two demon-possessed men and the response to it, which is really no faith at all. This week, uh, the story is two men have demons. It's weird. They come to Jesus. Uh, he casts the demons into a herd of pigs. The pigs run off a cliff and into the water. And uh, it's a true story. Now, how do we come to terms with this story today? Uh, how do we understand this? Uh, well, um, in our culture, I meet kind of... Uh, people who maybe they think too much about this kind of thing, supernatural realm, and then there are others who think too little about this kind of thing. And in this room, you are going to be somewhere on this spectrum. You think too much, you think too little. And the outcome is that as we come to church and as we come to Christianity, often we can think, I don't want to be one of those crazy extremists, but nor am I an atheist. I do believe in the spiritual realm. And so as Christians, we can often just go, I just need to take the middle, the middle route. But the middle route isn't the route you ought to take. And the reason for that is you've got to be careful of your instincts. I'll come back to that in just a second. We need to be aware of our instincts. Um, we all have instincts uh, with how we, uh, in how we kind of approach things and understand things. And particularly when it comes to the spiritual realm, when it comes to the spiritual realm, we hear someone talking about demons. We all have an instinct that we bring to hearing about this kind of thing. I'll give you an example from the secular world and then come and talk about uh, how this applies to demons. This is me and Evie uh, up at my favourite uh, holiday destination in summer, Norahead. And 
One of the instincts kids have, and maybe adults have when you teach them to surf, is uh, it's the wrong instinct. I take my kids out on surfboards, fortunately I have these foam surfboards these days, but sometimes I take them out on these very hard, long, heavy uh, surfboards, and one of the things I constantly need to tell the kids is, don't let the board get between you and the wave. For some reason, uh, that's what people who are beginning to surf always do. They put the board between the wave. I think they think, oh, the wave's so uncertain, I'm scared of the wave. The board's more familiar, so trying to protect themselves from the wave, they put the board between them and the wave. And of course, what happens when you do that? The wave comes, it's immovable, it's rolling through, it's going to hit the board, the board's free-floating, what's it going to hit? You in the head. But for some reason, it's the instinct, I don't know, of kids, that they always stand behind the board between and let the board be between the waves and them. And that is the most dangerous thing to do. And so their instinct, uh, familiar, surfboard, wave unfamiliar, I'm going to kind of hide behind the familiar, the very opposite of what you should do. And we need to be conscious of our instincts. We've got all these kind of instinctual ideas that what the demonic realm should be, should not be, and we need to be aware of the instincts that we bring to this topic today. Now, the issue really isn't thinking too much or too little about these things. The issue really is the worldview, the I that we bring to understand these things. And so there are some of us who, as soon as we hear talk about demons, we psychologize it. If someone claims to have been attacked by an evil spirit, we think they must be on medication that they've forgotten to take. We think maybe they've got multiple personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, that they're severely disturbed, suffering from some kind of disassociative disorder. And that is the instinctive reaction that many of us bring to this topic. And it comes from a view of existence that life in this world, which is shaped by a worldview called materialism. And materialism is a worldview, it's a belief system, an unprovable belief system, that there's nothing more than simply nature and matter in the world around us, that the universe and humanity is nothing more than our physical atoms. And this worldview, it breeds very little thought about spiritual things, and that shows a total misunderstanding about the nature of existence. So if your instinct is that you hear about these things and you think, oh, they're crazy, they're schizophrenic, multiple personality disorder, they need to go on medication. Often that's bred by a materialistic worldview. But there are others of us for whom we hear about this stuff and we get very excited. And the second instinct is people who don't deny it, but rather often give it too much attention. And there is a wing of Christianity which... Because our world doesn't believe in anything supernatural, and because we're Christians, we do believe in the supernatural. God is a supernatural spirit who doesn't have flesh and blood. He doesn't have atoms. Uh, he is a spirit. We do believe in spiritual supernatural. And there are some Christians who, because the world so denies it, they double down and they become overly focused and obsessed with it. And they, th they say things like, everyone needs to learn more about the devil. Because if you don't know about him, he's going to come and get you. And they say the secret to dealing with the enemy is to know everything about him. You've got to get one step ahead of him. And so you must educate yourself about the devil thoroughly so that you can avoid his attacks. But the reality is, in the Bible, the Bible speaks far less about spiritual forces of evil than the surrounding pagan nations around about them. You read the Bible and you see how very few times, actually, it ever pays attention to the demons. It speaks far, far less. And when it does speak about the spiritual forces, it brings a completely different framework. It says that everything is under the control of God. In pagan 
in the pagan worldview, there's this yin and yang. There's this balance. They're the forces of evil, and they are the true counterpart to the forces of good. That is not biblical at all. The Bible doesn't teach that there is any real contest between God, the God of the Bible, and Satan. The contest is not at all equal. No, the Bible teaches that God is sovereign, and even the evil spirits are subordinate to God. He hasn't lost control of them. So there's this book that was written many years ago, This Present Darkness, by a guy called Frank Peretti, a Christian man. And he wrote these books, uh, works of fantasy fiction, to try and help us understand and portray the spiritual realm that we are living in. And he portrays this spiritual battle going on in a small town in America. And the opening scene is of a demon trying to attack a man of prayer. And there are two angels that appear to help drive off the demon. Now, I believe all of that's true, probably. Like, there, there are demonic forces that try and stop us from... And there are angels. I'd love to do a sermon series on angels. Uh, but there are angels that actually are sent by God to help us. So I've got no issues so far in that. But one of the angels says, as they look at the demonic activity they're seeing in the town, there's this enormous rise of activity. And one of the angels says something like, I've never seen so much demonic activity. Do you think we'll win? And the other angel says, well, we'll fight. No acknowledgement that the victory is theirs. Uh, just the insistence that we'll fight. And that makes for a great story, but terrible theology. Because the Bible says there is no contest. The evil spirits answer to Jesus. So what we need as a church is not more thinking, not less thinking. They're actually completely different worldviews that we bring to the Bible. And in fact, the Bible is written to drive out a whole pagan way of thinking about the spiritual realm. And yet, you have a Christian book written by a Christian man, Frank Peretti. He's trying to do good, but he brings this whole pagan way of thinking to Christians, which is there's this equal fight. The Bible is written to say there is a different way to view the world. Uh, not one that's materialistic, not one that's pagan, but there is a God who is absolutely sovereign, that there is no great battle, and he stands against the forces of evil. And as a result, we need to clear up what the Bible says about spiritual warfare. We need to scrape back the layers of paint to arrive at what was originally said in the Bible, but which has been obscured by 2,000 years of Christians trying to say helpful things, but which aren't true to the Bible. So, let's do that today. Open up your Bibles, Matthew chapter 8, and let's look at this remarkable story. This is how it begins. When Jesus arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men came from the tombs to meet him. Now, this was not a Jewish region. It's up north in the area of Israel, uh, near the Sea of Galilee, on the western side of Sea of Galilee, that's the area that you're most familiar with that Jesus did his ministry in, Capernaum and Galilee. But on the eastern side, that's the Gentile region. And last week, we watched Jesus travel across the Sea of Galilee uh, from west to east. And this week, he arrives in this region. And in this region, um, it's probably the modern region of Kersey, and there are steep slopes near the shore cave nearby, which were used as tombs, and here's a little bit of drone footage that I found on YouTube uh, this week. So you can see this is the region where Jesus did this. And on arrival to the town, uh, two demon-possessed men come to Jesus from the tombs to meet him. The word literally is they were demonized. And when that word is used in the New Testament 13 times, it refers to a person or pigs who have uh, taken up residence in the body of animate beings uh, that they've been taken control of. And I think you can kind of, kind of have three different kinds of demonic work in the life of people. You have this, that you're demonized, taken possession over. 
You can, um, you can be oppressed by demons, that is, you're not taken over completely, but you're oppressed by them. And I, I've met people even in our congregation who've had that kind of experience. And the third kind of experience, which we all have, is we come under the influence of evil spirits. But I'm not really going to talk about that today. These men were demonized, taken over by evil spirits. And we're told they came from the tombs to meet Jesus. And verse 28, they were so violent that no one could pass that way. Remember last week, the disciples met a violent storm that no one had any power to deal with except for Jesus. This week, uh, these men, Jesus comes face to face with this situation that no human had any power over. This was an unstoppable, unrelenting force of evil in the world which neither the men nor their neighbours could do anything about. Mark's Gospel tells us that one of these men had been bound with chains and shackles, but they broke the chains and shackles. Such was their supernatural strength. And he also tells us that at least one of the men slashed himself with sharp stones. Such was his misery. And the men, they come to Jesus and they cry out, well, not the men, the demons, they cry out, what do you want with us, verse 29? What do you want with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? It's not the men who cry out, it's the demons. And isn't it interesting that they say, what do you want with us, Son of God? Now that is the second time in the Gospel of Matthew that uh, someone calls Jesus the Son of God. Any guesses for who the first person to call Jesus the Son of God is in the Gospel of Matthew? Anyone? John the Baptist, not John the Baptist. Who? Ben said Satan. Yeah, Satan. Right? So, so far in the Gospel of Matthew, no human being has yet uh, realized who Jesus is, but Satan knows who he is. And finally, these demons know who Jesus is. Remember last week, the disciples, they see Jesus calm the storm. They say, what kind of man's this? They haven't yet worked it out. So the demons know better than the disciples do. When everyone else, whatever everyone else fails to see, the demons see. But not only that, you know, they say to Jesus, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? They know their fate. That it's torment. They believe there's an appointed day, a day on which they will be tormented and punished by Jesus himself. They know Jesus will bring that day, but they weren't expecting that that day would be this day. They know that Jesus has come to establish the kingdom of God. They know that the judgment of the world is coming in the future, but they were astonished that Jesus had rocked up now so early. And they are afraid that he's going to start this day. And they're saying, hang on, it's too early. This isn't according to the script. Have you really come out of time? It's not the appointed time yet. See, why did Jesus come? We get it here. Jesus has come to destroy the works of evil. In Matthew, Mark's gospel, explaining why he drives out demons, he says, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Jesus is saying, I'm the strongest one. And I've come into the world to overpower Satan, and I'm going to take what he has. And this story is an example of him doing just that. This is why he's come. He's come to drive out evil from the world, and the demons know it. And they are terrified. So notice, they know that Jesus is the Son of God. They respect his authority. They tremble before him. They're focused on the coming kingdom of God. That Jesus was bringing victory over the evil and bringing them torment and that they're going to be judged by him. So they have great theology. You might even say they have faith. They do have faith. They believe a bunch of right things about Jesus. But the problem is, yeah, they believe in Jesus, but they hate him. They fear him, but they don't love him. And notice in each one of these nine stories, we're learning about what true faith is. They 
they're, they believe all the right stuff, good, but they just hate him. And so what true faith is, you've got to believe the right stuff, but you've got to love him. But they don't love him, they hate him, and they beg him, don't torture us, verse 30, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And Jesus said to them, go. So they come out and they went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Now, what's the deal with those pigs? Uh, not sure. <laughs> uh, we're going to come to that right at the end. Uh, but don't you just love that word Jesus says, go? There's power. There's authority. Just think of it. Uh, Mark says that this man had a legion of demons in him. A legion was thousands. It was a military unit in the Roman Empire. Thousands of soldiers. And Jesus says one word. Go. And they go. Last week he rebukes the wind and the waves with just two words. Quiet. Still. And if you remember the centurion, he asked Jesus to heal his servant. And Jesus says, sure, I'll come with you. And the centurion says, you don't need to come. Just say the word and you'll be healed. And Jesus says the word and he's healed. And then right back to the start of chapter 8, the leper comes to Jesus. Do you remember this? And he says to Jesus, Jesus, if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus says, I am willing. The power of Jesus' words. Don't miss the theme going on in these chapters. It's the word of Jesus that saves and heals and delivers and transforms people's lives. That's why we teach this. There is no great battle. Jesus says a word, boom, it happens. He commands the demons and they flee. Right? You've got to get this because the pagan worldview creeps into the church and teaches us, oh no, you've got to be really worried about it. You've got to do all of this kind of weird stuff to get the demons to go and notice Jesus says a word so what we do in church each week where we study the words of Jesus and we let them and we proclaim the words of that is how demons are cast out of people you know someone says why don't we see more of this today I said that's what we're doing every week in church it's the word of Jesus that drives out demons there's a there's a guy in our church who uh who hears voices, and uh, he grew up in a Christian home, walked away, and he realized, you know, he, he's, and uh, recently he, he asked the voices, are you demons? And they said, yes. And he, and he realized, I've got to turn to Jesus. And so he prayed to Jesus, Jesus, come and help me. And the voices stopped. And he started coming to church here. <laughs> and he wants more of the word of Jesus. The voices return. He prays to Jesus, and they go. They torment him. Yes, but, you know how? What do we? How do we engage? We hear the voice of Jesus. The voice of Jesus has the power. Not holy water. Not crucifixes. Not garlic. It's the word of Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's the word of Jesus that casts the demons out. And. Uh, Surely there are people in this room. You've had experiences in the occult with demons. And what is it that sets you free? It's Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says, go. The demons leave the, man, the men. They drown the pigs in the sea. And those tending the pigs ran off, verse 33. They went into the town, reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him... They pleaded with him to leave their region. Now remember, these stories are to teach us who Jesus is and what the right response to him is. The message of... The, it's very simple. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. He has the power to do only what God can do. Drive out... De no one else could restrain these men. They couldn't even walk near them. Jesus, with one word, they're out. They're done. The men are saved. With one word, two words, he, he calms the storm. He heals the sick. He destroys the works of evil. Who is he? He is the son of God. The demons get it. Don't you? And what is the right way to respond to him? By faith. You believe that he is the son of God and you come to him for mercy. 
And notice the demons do believe in him, but it's not true faith. And the whole town do believe in him. They've seen what he's done. They don't dispute it, but they don't come to him. They ask him to leave. See, the issue is never with the evidence. The reason people don't believe in Jesus then and don't believe him now is because they don't want to. They don't want to bow down to his authority and call him Lord. Jesus says elsewhere, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He's the son of God. The right response is, don't ask him to leave. Sit at his feet, learn from him and put your trust in him. Now that's the story. It's very simple, really. But remember, we need to keep peeling back the paint that is the layers that have obscured the gospel. Because here's where I think we get tripped up. Similar to last week, you know, what does this story mean for us? What, go out, confront supernatural evil by casting out demons into pigs? Is that the application of this passage to our lives this week? Jesus came in contact with demon-possessed men and he cast them out. Therefore, how do you answer that question? How do you apply this story to your life? How should we apply it? Why aren't we seeing more demon-possessed people in our lives? Why am I missing out on this crazy supernatural experience of life that Jesus had? Maybe I'm missing out on something. Maybe I need to get more in touch with the supernatural. Maybe our church should stop teaching the Bible so much and we ought to start driving out some evil spirits. Should we be doing more of this as a church? See, here's where I think we get caught out because this is not what the passage is saying to you. For the simple reason that you are not Jesus. It was his job to drive out the evil spirits from our world. He hasn't given you that job. And there are reasons why you get these dramatic encounters with demons when Jesus arrived. When the Son of God comes into this world to assert his rule and authority and bring his kingdom, all of a sudden you get this flurry of activity. It's not there in the Old Testament. It's not there in the, New Te the rest of the New Testament. It's just here in the Gospels because when the Son of God arrives, the devil knows he's on his last legs and he puts up a fire. The guy who's going to get him has arrived and, he's, and Jesus is going to tie him up and plunder his goods and that's what he does. You see, this is the good news. Jesus has come to neutralize Satan, and that's what he's done, so that you don't have to. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, notice what it says. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, speaking about us, Jesus shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those all their lives who are held in slavery by their fear of death. What has Jesus come to do? He's come to free you from the power of Satan over you. It's his work. It's not your work. His work to free people from Satan. And he does it by his death. By his death, he breaks the power of Satan by freeing us from our fear of death. Now, how does this work? Well, Satan is the accuser. Literally, that's what the word means. And that's what he does. That's the power he has over us. Toby Neal, you wicked, evil sinner. You can't be forgiven by God. You deserve to be punished by God because you're an evil, wicked sinner. And not only does he accuse us to our faith, he accuses God. He says, Toby Neal claims to be a Christian, look at all the sin in his life, punish him. That's what he rightly deserves. He is the accuser and that's what he does. He accuses us of our sin and he's got a point because according to God's law, God's word says the sinner deserves death because the wages of sin is death. And so he holds us by our fear of death. Because we fear death because we're sinners. Death is our judgment. And he accuses us. We do deserve death. So he holds the power of death by his accusation. 
But what does Jesus do on the cross? You know this. He dies our death, pays our sin. And here's the thing, if he's died for our sins and we're forgiven of our sins, what grounds of accusation does the devil now have? Absolutely nothing. He says, Toby, that wicked sinner. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm a wicked sinner. That's why Jesus died for me, dude. <laughs> You've got nothing against me anymore. right? Oh, but he goes to God. Oh, Toby did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. Jesus comes along and says, yeah, I know. I died for it all. What else are you going to say, Satan? His accusation has been removed. His fangs have been removed. He has been neutralized, which is great news. And so to quote one of my old Bible college lecturers, there's no need to fear, but plenty of reasons to laugh. Plenty of reasons to rejoice, because Jesus has neutralized the devil. Sure, the devil's still around. He still possesses people influences people, oppresses people. But the New Testament tells us that we're to be alert, we're to resist him, but we're not to treat him too seriously because Jesus has already defeated him. So how do we engage in the spiritual war that God has placed us in? Well, what does the book of Ephesians say? Do you remember the church in Ephesus were the most steeped in the occult. They were the ones who, when they became Christians, they had all of these magic books where they'd cast spells, uh, they'd pray to demons to get supernatural spiritual power over their neighbours and over their business competitors. So if ever there was a church that needed to be practising exorcism ministries and having garlic and crucifixes and holy water, this was it. And at the end of the book... His letter, the Apostle Paul says to them, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but but against the rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. Okay, so he's like, yes, it's happening. Yes, you Christians are engaged in this spiritual fight. You've got to put on the armor. Now, if you were reading that, what would you expect the armor to be? Holy water. Chris, I don't know. What, what is it that you expect? Well, what does the Apostle Paul says the armor is? Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And he continues, and, uh, and pray. Now notice what all those things have in common. It's the basic Christian life. Hey, yeah, we are a church, we're going to be assaulted by the evil one. What do we do? Trust Jesus. Pray for each other. Study the Bible. Repent of sin, be righteous, pay attention to the truth of the Word of God and not lies. Be ready to share the gospel of peace with people. It's the ordinary Christian life. God has given you everything you need to stand firm against the forces of evil in the world. We shouldn't be worried about the devil. We shouldn't be afraid of the devil, despite what some Christians have said. What some Christians do, they increase fear. And that's the opposite of what Jesus came to bring because genuine Christian ministry doesn't bring fear, it brings assurance and peace and joy. Because we're talking about the gospel of Christ, that he died our death, that he's risen again, that he sits in heaven, that he's defeated Satan. We have a more important message than just being obsessed with the devil, Christ has risen from the dead. So notice, we're we're scraping back the paint, the layers that obscure genuine Christianity. Final question, what about the pigs? (laughs) What about the flippin' pigs? Now, um, 
uh, one of the things which no one really has any idea about is the pigs, all right? Uh, can evil spirits inhabit animals? Apparently. Why does Jesus grant their request to go into the pigs? Why did they drown the pigs? Where are those demons now? And we can make guesses at these, but God hasn't answered our questions. But don't miss what we're meant to know and understand about the pigs. Two guys meet Jesus, get saved, and the demons enter and drown a bunch of pigs. Those tending the pigs run off and tell the people in town, and the, people, the townsfolk come out and they see what's happened and they all fall down before Jesus and put their trust in him. Is that what happens? No, it's not what happens, is it? They come out, the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with Jesus, leave our town. We don't want you here. Now, why would they plead with Jesus to leave their town? It's got to do with the pigs. Why do they ask Jesus to leave? Because the pigs were their investments. And Mark tells us that 2,000 of them got drowned on this day because Jesus cast some demons out of those crazy guys that have lived among the tombs. And these townsfolk, notice, didn't care about the lives of these men who were saved. They only care about how their investments are doing. And it's obvious that Jesus is a threat to their investments, so they tell him to leave. Why did the demons ask to go into the pigs? Well, you don't really know, but look at the outcome. Everyone wants Jesus to leave. If you're a demon, that's a pretty good outcome. The demons, they love nothing more than people begging Jesus to leave them. The demons are opposed to Jesus and his people, and they do whatever they can to cause people to be like the people of this city. They begged Jesus to leave. And that is the most effective work of Satan in the world to do. Demon possession still happens, yes. But the most profound work of Satan in our world is to keep people from being interested in Jesus. And there are lots of people who prefer pigs to people, who prefer commerce to Christ. And this town was far more comfortable with demons living among them than the Son of God coming into them. What about us? What about our city? God wants us to love people more than our possessions. That's the application of this. People more than pigs. And to Jesus, the lives of these two men were much, much more valuable than the lives of those 2,000 pigs. So I wonder whether, are you more concerned about people or your possessions? You know, Australians spend twice as much on pets every year than they do on charitable giving. We're just like these townspeople. We care more about pigs and pets than people hearing about Jesus. And this is the start of the year. It's a great time to evaluate. Do you care more about your possessions or do you care about people hearing the gospel and being set free from the power of Satan in their life? You know, there's this KFC ad, which my kids love. Uh, they don't stop, they don't shut up about this ad. Uh, and uh, we never go to KFC. I don't think they've ever been in KFC in their life, but they know the ad. You know the ad? Shut up and take my money. <laughs> stop saying that. And that's why I've called this sermon, Shut Up and Take My Pigs. Because Christians don't ask Jesus to leave. They ask him, Jesus, do you need more of my pigs? Because if that's going to mean more people get saved in their lives, take my pigs. Shut up and take my pigs. See, that's the right response to Jesus. To see who Jesus is, to respond in faith, to give generously that others might know Jesus and have their life trans transformed. But they ask Jesus to leave. And many people leave Jesus out of their life because of what he has to say about their possessions. Is there any hope for these townspeople? Yes, because Mark tells us that one of the men asked Jesus, hey Jesus, can I come with you? One of these dem 
He's like, I don't want to stay in this town. Like, they've seen me naked. They've seen me crazy. They've seen me cutting. My, like, just bad memories in this town. Please, can I come and have a never-ending Bible study with you and all your mates? That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And Jesus says to him, no. He says, go and tell everyone who you were and who you are now and what I've done for you. And he goes, serious? And Jesus is like, yep, because they're all scared of me. But you've got a great story. And he goes into town and starts telling people. And the next time Jesus returns to this area, Jesus finds lots and lots and lots of interest in his message. See, the demons, they attack the pigs. Why? Because that's what the people love. And the demons know pigs gone, they're going to ask Jesus to leave. Jesus lets the pigs, the the demons attack the pigs. Why does he do that? Because he wants to confront the people what actually possesses them. Greed. Their pigs possess them. And then he sends this man into their lives and slowly over time he explains what Jesus has done for them and slowly the people of the city start to repent. Someone once said there's more than one possession in this passage. There's the obvious one, the demon possession, but there's the other one, the pig possession of the people. My investments, my money. And Jesus deals with both. What possesses you? What's getting in the way of Jesus? He can free you with nothing but a word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this remarkable story. We thank you that you've come to free us from our fear of death, fear of demons, fear of evil that still exists in the world, but we're not to fear it because you're stronger. You are alive, you've risen, you've conquered, and you have the victory. And we share in that victory with you. Oh, we know that if we walk away from you, we ought to be terrified. If we give ourselves over to greed and lust and lies and depravity, yes, we come under the influence of Satan. So we come to you, Jesus, now, repenting of our sin, asking for more truth, more faith, We're praying for each other that we be kept from the power of Satan, that we might stand firm in the full armor that you've given us. Help us, give us to the normal Christian life, the ordinary things, prayer, the Bible, loving one another. These are the things by which we will stand against Satan and his forces. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have the victory and that you've rescued us not only from our sin, but the forces of evil. And we make this prayer in your name. Amen.